In the 1960s in the United States, with the passing of the Civil Rights Act, we saw what many consider to be sort of the official end of the absolute most explicit and formal types of government racism. When we ended mandated segregation, we outlawed many other types of racial discrimination. But since then, and really to this day, black and Hispanic Americans continue to suffer from a variety of social and economic inequities with regard to wealth, education, health outcomes, cycles of crime and incarceration. The, the list is a mile long when we're talking about socioeconomic adversities that disproportionately impact populations of color. Over the past 50 or 60 years in the time since the civil rights movement, we've seen many racial equality movements try to illuminate and put a spotlight on and address these problems. And these movements tend to acknowledge that these problems are the ripple effects of historical institutional racism like slavery and Jim Crow. David, you just said the groups that were facing difficulties were both blacks and Hispanics. The vast majority of Hispanics living in this country came after the Civil Rights Act. So how can the legacy of Jim Crow and slavery affect them? They weren't slaves, David. Then also, why are all the Asians who immigrated here immune from all of this systemic racism? Are those racist whites just biased against dark people? Eh, no, that's also bullshit. Dark-skinned immigrants from India seem to do just fine in America. There's no racism in the system, David. And these movements have pushed for solutions that are designed to help these groups in particular as remedies for problems that impact them disproportionately. This has taken the form of affirmative action, scholarships for minority students, busing to integrate schools, federal financial support for historically black colleges, government programs that help minority businesses. These are all forms of action that solve or try to solve race based problems in the United States. These aren't solutions. They've been doing this shit for 60 years. 60 fucking years, David. Guess what? It didn't help black people. If anything, these things hurt blacks. Take affirmative action. Let's say I'm black and I want to be a lawyer. I go to a school willing to accept me despite my shitty LSAT score. The LSAT is a proxy IQ score that tests logical ability and reading comprehension. Because everyone is smarter than me at my school, I am guaranteed a spot in the bottom of the class. In fact, I'm a buffer, David. I ensure that whites will get all of the top spots. They'll graduate with honors. They'll make it on to law review. I'll be lucky if I even graduate. Then there's the blacks who wouldn't have been accepted into any law school if they were white. The ones with a minuscule chance to pass the bar exam. Is saddling people with no hope of ever becoming a lawyer with $150,000 in student loan debt helping the problem? David, is that how we fight systemic racism? Ruining people's lives with debt that they can't repay? What about employers? We'll just hire black people that aren't qualified. So now black people will be the most likely to get fired from their jobs. They'll be the most likely to have to pick up the pieces of their career and try and restart something. This means that blacks will also experience all the social problems with losing a job at a higher rate than whites. But black people, keep listening to David Pakman and the Democrats. Over the past half century, what we've also seen consistently in parallel is pushback against these racial equality initiatives. Here are a few clips of some popular conservatives making comments which I believe accurately sum up, sum up the prevailing right wing narrative on systemic racism with regard to socioeconomics. One could certainly say during the Jim Crow era, when when you know African Americans couldn't vote, that, that's systemic racism. You have you have things in the system that are contributing to racism. Is systemic racism still a reality today? It is not a reality. It, it is the opposite of a reality. It's a, an illusion. If you can point to me to the law or the practice that's in place that makes that somehow keeps me out. If there's two people that, that are working the exact same and putting out the same, exerting the same amount of effort, and you're going to tell me that as a black person, I can't get ahead. It doesn't exist. There are lots of rich black people in America. 
And there are lots of poor white people in America. Oh, yeah. So what? So yeah. it, it, because d- black people in the United States are disproportionately poorer than white people in the United States, it's actually yeah. it's ignoring the real problem, which is how do we get poor people to be richer? Systemic racism does not exist. There are no laws in America, meaning the system. Doesn't mean racism doesn't exist. Racism exists. There are people who are racist, and you should do everything you can to show them that their ideas are wrong and that you should not be judging someone based on their race, of course. But the idea that there is systemic racism, meaning that there are laws in place that treat black people differently or Asian people differently or white people differently, simply doesn't exist. If you can get an economy that's as free as possible, you will have more and more people, regardless of the color of their skin, being able to partake in an economy. So those comments uh, cover a bunch of the predominant views from the right on systemic racism. Those were clips of three of the most popular right wing online broadcasters. So the first thing I want to point out is they are defining systemic racism so narrowly that it would only refer to racism by the government and only the most explicit and official forms of government racism, like Jim Crow, for example. And that's how they're able to say that systemic racism doesn't exist. When I say that systemic racism is complete made up bullshit, I don't limit it to the government. I don't believe schools, criminal justice institutions or corporations are systemically racist against blacks. I would say that schools and corporations are systemically racist against white people and Asians. I'd also say Hollywood in particular is systemically racist against Hispanics and Asians. If someone's constantly asserting something that everyone already accepts is true, such as slavery and Jim Crow no longer exist, it's likely that they're either accidentally or purposefully misunderstanding what they are trying to argue against. That's what's happening here. I've never encountered someone who asserts that systemic racism is a problem today while defining racism in such a narrow way. People usually use the term systemic racism to denote any type of racial biases, formal or informal by a system or someone acting on behalf of a system, which could take the form of racial bias by police officers or by a law enforcement system, racial bias by people hiring at a company, racial bias in education, like a standardized test that puts certain racial groups at a disadvantage. Well, I don't believe any of those things are true. I don't think that the police show any racial bias. Standardized tests aren't racist. Companies that hire people aren't biased against blacks. David, you have a cartoon view of what conservatives believe. You pretend that people like Candace Owen actually agrees with you, but just deliberately deceives people anyways by defining systemic racism narrowly. No. Conservatives don't believe these institutions are biased. Conservatives aren't a bunch of secret leftists who lie to people because they're evil. Give me a fucking break. It doesn't even necessarily have to be racism by an individual, importantly. It could just be a system doing something that in practice disadvantages members of a certain group on the basis of their race. And I think that the concept requiring a little bit of nuance is exactly why Some people get confused. Some people get defensive about the word racism being involved. So maybe we can have a separate conversation about finding a better term, which is fine. But that's what people mean when they say there is active systemic racism present in the year 2020. So I think a lot of conservatives are confused about the definition if they act as though it's synonymous only with slavery and Jim Crow or Some of them are straw manning in bad faith to avoid actually engaging with the reality on the ground. But the conservatives I played in the clips, what they also seem to be saying is that systemic racism, as someone like me would define it, doesn't exist. Their sentiment is slavery and Jim Crow are over. Uh, Black people no longer face any types of disadvantages. There are no systemic biases against black people. There are no lingering effects from historical institutional Uh, inequality, unfairness that still leave the deck stacked against minority individuals. There you go. That's a pretty good statement of the conservative view on systemic racism. Black and white people 
on average have identical opportunity to succeed, they would assert. You were doing so well there, David. Now you're fucking it up again. Black people are poorer on average than whites. They have a very different culture. They live in different places. Of course, they have different opportunities. The point conservatives make is that racism is not the cause of these different opportunities. The other thing they seem to be saying is that because they don't believe those racial biases exist. We shouldn't be looking at minority poverty through the lens of race in order to solve it with racial social justice action. They say we should instead look at black poverty, for example, as an arbitrary piece of poverty as a whole. And we should try to solve black poverty merely by fixing poverty as a whole. And in addition to saying that racial solutions to, for example, black or Hispanic poverty are unnecessary. OK, I actually maybe agree with David on this. There is clearly a connection between black culture and poverty. Black poverty is more intractable than poverty in general. It might make sense to approach the problem differently from the perspective of government policy. What I'd reiterate, though, is I don't believe black poverty has anything to do with bias against black people. Often they will add that those racial solutions dismiss, ignore or belittle white poverty and they discount the personal responsibility of non-white individuals to improve their own lives. But it's not surprising that that's the direction conservatives would go because each of those pieces fits beautifully into the conservative meta narratives that we've been following. For example, racial inequality is generally overblown. Identity politics is bad. Government intervention is the wrong way to fix anything. Capitalism and meritocracy ultimately are the answers to everything. I'd agree with the first two things you said. The second two, not so much. Are you sure you're addressing conservatives? Because it sounds to me like you're directing your arguments towards libertarians. You had Ben Shapiro up there after all. Not only do black folks in many respects have worse outcomes on average, black folks also have diminished opportunity to improve those outcomes compared to white people on average, on average. That's what these conservatives are missing. And it's the reason why it is actually useful to explore certain solutions that are tailored towards certain particular racial inequalities. OK, can you give examples of what the fuck we're supposed to do? I don't even know how to respond to this. He's like, we might want to consider unique problems that black people have. OK, fine. What is it exactly you want us to do? Also, saying we should address black poverty doesn't prove systemic racism is real. In some ways, black and white poverty can be different. There are many metrics that illustrate gaps between a black person and a white person of the same income. OK, that's fantastic, David. This video is called The Truth About Systemic Racism. You've offered no relevant information on the subject so far. I'm sure black people and white people have very different experiences in America. It doesn't mean the system is racist. There was a groundbreaking study by Stanford and Harvard researchers from 2018, which combined census data on race with IRS tax returns, allowing them to compare the income of parents with the income of their grown children over the span of 1989 to 2015 for the purpose of tracking intergenerational mobility, which is the degree to which children economically surpass their parents or fall behind. And what they found is that downward mobility occurs at a much higher rate among black Americans than among white Americans when you compare black and white people with similar incomes. This was true even among the children of higher income parents of both races, children of white parents in the top fifth of the income distribution have a 41 percent chance of staying at that income level. Children of black parents in that highest income level only have an 18 percent chance of staying at that income level. So regardless of how much money your parents make, if you are black, you are less likely to achieve the economic status of your parents or higher. OK, but how does that prove anything about racism? We already know that black people have much higher crime rates. Thomas Sowell has written a book about how black culture is based around honor rather than dignity. That's going to be a recipe for high risk behavior. High risk means higher chance of falling into poverty. Sadly, 
I can already imagine some people are going to butt in with, oh, well, maybe it has something to do with intelligence or single parenthood or something like that. The study found that the black white mobility gap is entirely driven by black and white males. There was very little gap between black and white females, which would rule out genetic factors between races as an explanation, if that's your sort of thing to look at. I already suggested that crime and honor culture were the actual cause of the mobility gap. Those are things that would mostly affect men, not women. I also don't think any conservative would argue that IQ would be the cause of a mobility gap. That doesn't make any fucking sense, David. The study also looked at family structure and it found that the huge gap is there regardless of whether children came from one or two parent homes which debunks the conservative idea that lower marriage rates are responsible. I think the conservative argument that fatherlessness causes black dysfunction is overblown. Children adopt the norms of their peers, not their parents. I have consistently argued that black culture is the cause of black dysfunction, the toxic honor culture. The worshipping of thugs and criminals, the narcissism, excessive bragging, and entitlement. The idea that working hard or studying is acting white. And then we have this constant celebration and propaganda by corporate America celebrating the people with the worst fucking attitudes in the entire world. That's the cause of consistently dog shit outcomes for black people. It's been going on this way for the last 60 years. All that being said, a father could help add some stability and divert their child back on the right path. I don't think merely restoring the black father is a solution. I do think it would help though. Let's break down this study he talks about. David Pakman is fucking wrong. Black fathers do make a difference. That's what the study says. Now it's a small difference, it can't explain the entire mobility gap, fine, but don't pretend like black fathers don't matter because the study says that they do. The study also has some pretty big flaws. It compares the wealth of children in their mid-30s to parents in their 40s or 50s. Most people's earnings increase over their lifetime. Thomas Sowell and others have criticized how socialists call out the 1% for this reason. For the most part, there is not a fixed class that has the highest incomes at all points during their life. Most Americans will get to be a high income earner when they near the end of their career. I guess you could say this flaw doesn't totally ruin the study. It's comparing racial groups so the same problem is applied to the other races as well. It does inflate the mobility gap though to make it appear much worse than it actually is. But a factor that does tend to powerfully predict economic mobility is the average income of the neighborhood in which a child was raised. A study by Harvard economists published in 2015 showed overwhelming evidence for this. The researchers looked at 16 years of tax records to track pairs of children and parents, and they found that the affluence of a child's neighborhood is the single best predictor of their long term upward mobility. The amount of money in an area where a child grows up is strongly correlated with that child's ability to achieve more socioeconomic success than their parents. The biggest problem with the study in terms of how David Pakman is trying to use it is it doesn't do what he's advocating for. It does not look at blacks taken from low income areas who were then moved to high income areas. We know the blacks in the high income areas got there because they earned high incomes. David Pakman just takes it as an article of faith that low income blacks can be moved to high income areas and then improve. He has no evidence of that. He has no data. The study also doesn't prove the existence of systemic racism. It doesn't prove racism plays any role in these mobility gaps. Culture isn't controlled for, nor could it ever be. You can't reduce culture down to demographic factors like single family homes or household wealth. Only an autistic liberal would even attempt something like that. A study was published in 2015 by the American Academy of Political and Social Science conducted by researchers at Stanford by looking at census data, which found that among black and white families with similar incomes, white families are much more likely to live in neighborhoods with higher average incomes. And of course, this means that the white family is more likely to have access to better schools, better childcare, better parks, 
better transportation options. The list of advantages in a high income neighborhood relative to a low income neighborhood is a very, very long list. And between a black and white family of similar income, the difference between the average incomes of their neighborhoods is not small. It's huge. OK, so what's your solution, David? Are you going to move all black people in the houses in the wealthiest area of the country? You need to change your video's title from the truth about systemic racism to the truth about systemic classism. Everyone already knows that wealthy people have huge advantages. Let's talk about whites. Most whites are poor or middle class. Very few are rich. If you're a rich one, there's a good chance you're super rich. Same with blacks, except blacks are more likely to be poor. They're also less likely to be rich. Here's where you depart from conservatives, David. I don't know how to make black people rich. I'm not rich myself, not even close. I can't even grow this fucking YouTube channel. What I can do is be middle class. That's been easy for me. I've never had a problem with it. I've never been convicted of a crime, never been to jail. It's a lot easier than you think. If you've got the magic solution to make black people rich, let's hear it. If not though, get out of the fucking way. Let the conservatives explain the black people how to be middle class. Try to do good on your schoolwork. Don't do drugs. Don't break the law. Drop the shitty attitudes. Get married. Don't become dependent on welfare. There you go. So to put all of this together, we have the mobility gap between black and white people of similar incomes. The mobility of anyone, regardless of race, tends to be predicted by the average income of the neighborhood where they grew up. And we see that a black family with the same income as a white family is more likely to live in a poorer neighborhood. And that's because black people tend to live near other black people and black people have lower incomes than white people on average. And of course, that is what we call racial housing segregation, the geographic separation of races. And it is a racial issue. So we've demonstrated one of many examples of a social problem in 2020, which can be usefully analyzed in terms of race, and it warrants racial justice action. The problem is that black folks have less upward mobility than white folks. The cause of the problem is racial housing segregation, and the solution would be integrating housing to a greater degree. David, now you're the one fucking around with definitions. We've clearly established class differences between blacks and whites. Those class differences probably result from different black and white cultures. There's been no evidence that they result from racism. You say we need to integrate housing. Integration was the term used to allow the freedom to blacks to travel and go anywhere they pleased in the Southeast. Here's what you're actually saying. The government needs to impose a fucking massive tax on the people. Then the government needs to use those taxes to buy luxury houses in wealthy neighborhoods. Then we need to corral all of the black people into these luxury houses. Would this help black people? Based on your studies, uh, maybe. Will it close the mobility gap? Fuck no. Your stupid academic studies don't account for culture. Black people don't want to join the middle class. They want to be rappers and gang members. Just look at what happened with Shanisha Taylor. Let's use New York City as an example. Before Bill de Blasio ruined the city, it was one of the wealthiest and safest cities in the world. Housing in Manhattan is insanely expensive. Only the wealthiest people can afford to live there. But a lot of black people also live there in public housing. They've lived there for fucking generations. Even living in one of the wealthiest cities in the world has done nothing to help these people. David Brown is the chief of the Chicago Police Department, a prestigious, high-paying position. In 2016, he was the chief of the Dallas Police Department. That year, his son was killed after his son shot a police officer. Why did the son of the Dallas police chief shoot a police officer? He was high on PCP and he had a psychotic breakdown. David Brown's brother was also murdered and a drug deal gone bad. Giving black people houses or cash payments doesn't solve these problems. The problems are cultural. All these fucking idiots on the left think that they're going to help blacks by legalizing drugs. They're making the problem even worse. There are so many other examples of social problems today 
that demand racial justice solutions in education, health care, the justice system. I'd have nowhere near enough time in this video to go into each and every one of them. So let's flesh out this example we're dealing with housing segregation. By housing segregation, you mean some houses are more expensive than others. You disingenuous piece of shit. Did you guys know we have flying segregation? Oh yeah, the airplane is less likely to have blacks in first class. Man, it's just like the South, circa 1955. Hey Vosh, didn't you say that no one on the left advocates for equality of outcome? Well, David fucking Pacman just said if blacks make less money than whites, then housing is segregated in the US. Before we start talking about solutions to segregation, we should contemplate how the housing segregation that exists today came to be. And now white people and black people are more segregated from one another than white people are segregated from Asian or Hispanic people, as examples and more so than poor and non poor people are segregated from one another. Bullshit. I don't disagree that white and black people were segregated in the Southeast back in the 30s. That was 90 fucking years ago. After the Civil Rights Act, there was a great migration of black people. Most black people resettled to other parts of the country. The idea that black people are still mostly confined to the same areas as they were during segregation is a bald-faced lie. And black-white segregation puts a hugely unfair burden on black people. It has much worse effects for a black family living in a black neighborhood who have the same income and education as a white family living in a white neighborhood. The average middle class black family lives in a neighborhood with a higher poverty rate than the average low income white person. Here's a reality about blacks. When blacks are successful economically, they often don't move to white suburbs. They instead move to high-end housing located near the same parts of town they lived in before. I know this is really going to blow your fucking mind, David, but black people aren't bothered by living near other blacks. In many urban cities, the black areas provide good commutes to jobs and entertainment. If blacks can live in nice high-end housing adjacent to black neighborhoods, a lot of the time they'll choose that. Again, racism has nothing to do with this. Segregation also prevents home values from appreciating in black neighborhoods because of white folks reluctance to buy a home in a black neighborhood, even when all other attributes of homes and neighborhoods are equal, which, by the way, is an example of systemic racism happening actively in the year 2020. And it's a type of systemic racism with a huge impact on black wealth since someone's home is often their largest financial asset. Yeah, houses in black neighborhoods in Atlanta seem to be doing just fine. So the crucial thing here is that higher poverty rates in the neighborhood means lower quality resources for everyone who lives there. Thanks for your base take as to why we need to stop immigration from third world countries. This is where we get to the distinction between desegregation and integration. Desegregation is when a government stops separating people. Integration is the process of unseparating those same people, which has not happened. So we're currently stuck in a state of segregation. Essentially, in a way, the Civil Rights Act did not accomplish as much as conservatives seem to think it did. It didn't hit the reset button on racial inequality. Racial groups in the United States are not on a level playing field. The Civil Rights Act was never intended to create an equality of outcome. So what can government do to counteract segregation as a way to give black people more economic opportunity? Well, to start with, we could reinstitute the Obama era policy of requiring localities that receive federal money for housing to identify and try to remedy housing practices that promote racial bias. Well, this didn't help anyone back when Obama was president. It's not going to help anyone now. The federal government isn't going to be able to create class neutral policies to help black people finance homes. Last time they tried fucking around with this, it caused a massive mortgage crisis, one that pretty much crippled the world's economy. The only way this works is if the feds would be willing to just buy homes for them. And if so, why the fuck do black people get a free house? My house cost me $200,000. I've been paying that shit off for almost 10 years now. If you're just going to give that away to black people, why the fuck should I do anything for this bullshit country? I might as well go on welfare and act like an obnoxious.
Commenting on his elimination of this anti racist policy, Trump actually tweeted, I am happy to inform all of the people living in their suburban lifestyle dream that you will no longer be bothered or financially hurt by having low income housing built in your neighborhood. Enjoy. That's another example of institutional racism in 2020, if I've ever seen one. Because you're a fucking dumbass. If you had a family, which you don't, because you're a pathetic YouTube weirdo, you wouldn't want gang members or criminals moving into your neighborhood. You also wouldn't give two shits if wealthy black people moved next to you. That's the real issue. Putting public housing in the middle of a wealthy suburb means putting drug addicts and criminals there. Those are the types of people who often live in public housing. I'm not saying that to be mean. It's just the honest truth. Another step we could take to counter segregation by reducing housing discrimination is to increase the use of fair housing testers who are individuals who pose as potential buyers and renters to gather information on possible instances of illegal racial housing discrimination. So you want the government to employ what a squad of liars? Look, David, lying is wrong. Didn't you learn that in kindergarten? We don't want the government paying people to lie and to spy on people. That's something that a fascist country would do. I know with all the bullshit that went on with the election, we're kind of going that direction. But America isn't supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be better than that. Government could also be bolstering inclusionary zoning policies, which require home builders to make sure that portions of new housing units are affordable to low and moderate income people to eliminate the financial barriers that often end up keeping poor black families from finding an affordable home in a good neighborhood. We could also be using more federal housing subsidies to help lower income black families move into better neighborhoods. The low income housing tax credit could be used to develop subsidized rental housing in non poor neighborhoods. Uh, the gap between the poor and middle class is tiny. The gap between middle class and rich is fucking massive. How do we afford to move all black people into the wealthiest neighborhoods in the country? Why would it work when it hasn't worked in places like New York City? I wouldn't want to empty the public coffers on some crackpot plan that doesn't even seem likely to work. The reality is racism can take many different forms. Some people just have an overly simplistic conception of what racism is. People start talking about systemic racism. Conservatives respond with, I have no idea what you're talking about. We have no more slavery. Jim Crow is over. We ended that a long time ago. So racial injustice no longer exists. That perspective misunderstands deliberately or accidentally what systemic racism is, and it ignores the fact that systemic racism exists and is just another form of racism. We also have to refute the common conservative notion that black hardships can only be productively discussed in the context of hardship or poverty in general, instead of acknowledging additional racial components that are often involved. There are some issues that are more accurately understood when you take into account racial injustices that may be at play so that you can solve them with specially catered solutions. This video provided no evidence of systemic racism. David Pakman should be ashamed of this video. I don't even know what else to say. He couldn't point to a single thing suggesting the system was racist. Even if black people could be moved to wealthy areas, I doubt it would change the number one obstacle to black success. That's of course the terrible culture and attitudes of black people. Anyways, that wraps up my response video. If you enjoyed this video and you're not subscribed to my channel, please support small YouTube channels like mine by subscribing. Thanks.